Uh, the DSI revolution, I call it a revolution because this is an inherently political uh, movement. And I'll talk about the impacts on longevity biotech or long bio, which is the field that I come from. Okay, so to give you an overview, I'll talk about my own background in the technological stagnation hypothesis. You may have heard of that before. Uh, some of the problems in biomedicine, academia, and industry alike. Glimmers of solutions and how DSI may help. And then a shout out to Longevity Biotech and some other projects that you might be interested in, namely Prospera and these charter cities, startup cities movement, and Vitalia, which is a longevity city that we're aiming to set up a pop-up city in Prospera. And you can check out YouTube for more info on any of these topics. So who am I? Sebastian Brunemeyer, I look, my, look myself in the mirror every day and ask this question. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm a biomedical scientist by training. I've spent about 10 years in the longevity biotech field um, in, in the lab bench at many academic institutions. Uh, I was an early employee at Apollo Ventures, which is one of the leading longevity-focused venture funds. Samsara Therapeutics is a company I built that works on autophagy enhancement, so mimicking the benefits of caloric restriction and fasting. Cambrian is another multi-asset longevity company that I co-founded. And today I work on rejuvenating the immune system at Immune Age Bio, as well as Healthspan Capital. We're the most active investor in the longevity biotech space today. Here's some other organizations that I work with. If you're interested in longevity, you should join the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. Um, Briefly on Healthspan Capital, we invest in longevity and regenerative medicine. Here are some of the team members I'm lucky to have around the table. They've worked at top uh, prestigious places, etc. cetera. Uh, here are some of our excellent portfolio companies. You can check out our website for more. If you guys know people in the longevity space uh, seeking to raise capital, get in touch. So um, I would argue that DSI is the most important revolution among scientific revolutions that we've had. Uh, it's the liberation of capital and technology from control by the corporation state, this merged corporation and state entity. And hopefully it can address the technological stagnation <laughs> hypothesis. So what is that hypothesis? Well, um, it was sort of popularized by Founders Fund uh, in this manifesto that's worth reading called What Happened to the Future. And basically it's summarized as we were promised flying cars and we got 140 characters. There's advancement in a narrow cone of progress in software or bits, but not in the deep tech world of atoms, which includes biotech. And so to quote the manifesto, they said, the best founders want to radically change the world for the better. To many investors, visionary entrepreneurs come off as naive or worse. Isn't it safer, easier, more profitable to create another social network for cat fanciers than to try to cure cancer, defeat terrorism, or organize the world's information? This is a book I definitely recommend checking out. Uh, how state regulation and industry complacency uh, together suppress innovation. It's called Where's My Flying Car? And you can actually get a, um, a preview of it with, um, with the author and my friend Nicholas Anziger on his excellent podcast. It's called The Stranded Technologies Podcast. It's actually my favorite podcast in the world, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, and he interviews a lot of the top thinkers in advanced technology from you know, nuclear energy to supersonic flight to synthetic biology and longevity and crypto, etc. So definitely check out that podcast. Um, here's a podcast in which I interviewed Nicholas for the Molecule podcast on the DSI podcast, in which we talk about what he's doing running this fund called Infinitive Fund, which is one of the leading investors in this network state startup cities world that tries to develop technology outside of the control of the legacy countries, so the larger established countries that are not so keen on innovation. He's actually investing in companies in uh, new jurisdictions. Uh, another person I want to call your attention to is Professor Terence Keeley. Uh, he uh, trained at Oxford. He is a professor of clinical biochemistry, vice chancellor of the University of Buckingham. He was at the Cato Institute. And he basically puts forward this very controversial thesis that state or government funding of science crowds out actual science, uh, applied science. So the argument he makes is basically the period with the highest innovation was the 19th century. Prior to government funding of science, we had the Industrial Revolution. So he argues, as many others do, that engineering and tinkering precedes formal science. The laws of thermodynamics came after the steam engine and the Industrial Revolution. In England, which was the only major European state at the time which did not fund science, 
same with the U.S. until 1900. And it's not like we didn't have enough innovation or technological advancement prior to this, the government funding of science. So there's a counterintuitive aspect to this, which is, well, isn't more money always going to be good? Uh, and actually, no, because there are only so many smart people on Earth. And so when a government hires this limited supply of scientists to waste their time in academic bureaucracies, battling for grants, publishing fake results, um, and only provides grants for incremental state-approved questions. So this is the mechanism by which it's counterintuitive, but government interference and state funding of science actually slows technological progress. So another podcast you should check out, Terence Keeley's done a couple of them. This is on the uh, Bitcoin Standard podcast, and he lays out his thesis, so I definitely recommend checking him out. Um, so this is, a, this is a chart of um, institutional decay. So it's uh, American confidence in institutions of all sorts. So the military, the media, Congress, etc. And in 1979, it was about 50%. Today, it's about 27%. So what's going on? Um, well, this is a book that uh, Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, uh, who's a rather smart cookie, endorses. And he says, all over the world, elite institutions from governments to media to academia are losing their, their authority and monopoly control on information to the broader public. This book has been my number one handout to anyone seeking to understand this unfolding shift in power from hierarchies to networks in the age of the internet. And uh, it's actually being published by Stripe Press. You guys know the company Stripe. And they're very keen on addressing the tech stagnation hypothesis, too. So you can go on Stripe Press and see a bunch of other cool books. So let's talk about state-funded uh, and underwritten science. So concentration of power entrenches scientific dogma. You may have heard of Lysenkoism. I think here in Berlin, it's uh, kind of relevant to talk about state communism. Uh, it's an example of state-enforced dogma. So Lysenko himself claimed that the idea of a gene was a bourgeois invention and not consistent with communist ideology. Um, in order to enforce their idea, as all good ideas need to be brutally enforced. Uh, 3,000 scientists were fired, some imprisoned, and some killed for resisting this idea. So in the U.S. and Europe, and this is uh, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, uh, in the U.S. and Europe, we don't usually have government officials determining the finer points of the dogma, but they do broadly determine what gets funded, so medicine versus military, or whether we ask certain questions like, hey, did COVID escape from a Wuhan lab. There was a point at which you were not allowed to ask that question, and then a little while later, the government actually came out suggesting that that might have happened. So we have councils of dogma-believing academic reviewers like the complex hierarchy of the Catholic Church with archbishops and, and cardinals, and the Pope tier being reserved for senior NIH and FDA career bureaucrats. Balaji Srinivasan, points out that their anonymity is their greatest power because they're unaccountable, except for Fauci in, in recent years because he's such a star, he loved limelight. So um, the Founders Fund uh, crew points out that by many objective metrics, uh, technolo technological progress is stalled. So we can see that travel speed uh, is actually slowed down. We had the Concorde, we had a supersonic jet that was decommissioned, and we haven't advanced travel speed really at all since then. There's another concept called the Henry Adams curve uh, that shows for a couple hundred years we were on this upward exponential trajectory in energy production. We kept discovering new forms of energy and using them more efficiently, but then somewhere around the 1970s we fell off that curve and it explains a lot about the, the stagnation. So uh, one example is actually nuclear energy. I used to be kind of a leftist hippie, and I was opposed to nuclear. Whenever I drove by a nuclear power plant, I would drive extra fast because I thought it would, it would you know, explode uh, at any moment. But it, it turns out that that's actually not how it works. So the nuclear death toll globally, only under 100 people have died from all nuclear meltdowns in history. And counterintuitively, nobody died directly from Fukushima. Um, so how many deaths, by comparison, has fossil fuel pollution and the related wars caused? Uh, uranium and thorium supply is nearly unlimited and cheap. We could run for thousands of years. New reactor designs are even safer. Some, it's literally impossible for them to melt down. And yet, no new reactor designs were approved in the United States since, since the 1970s. Um, we also have small modular nuclear reactors that are cheaper and decentralized and not controllable centrally, but can be made in an in a assembly line. So there's a theory that 
maybe this uh, stalling progress in nuclear energy and other forms of energy has been uh, suppressed by the fossil fuel industry, kind of like how the airline industry ripped out all of the trains and prevented any trains from being built in the United States. So uh, it begs the question, are there similar cartel dynamics occurring um, in, the, in the field of medicine? Maybe hold your questions till the end. Thanks. So, so a similar dynamic may be occurring in biomedicine. We haven't really seen much progress in medicine despite all of the headlines. Uh, we'll talk about cancer. It's sometimes said that a progress is seen everywhere in oncology except in the mortality statistics. So um, the, here's an example of this going wrong where it's getting exponentially more expensive to get a new drug approved even though the technology that we use to discover new drugs is getting better. You know, semiconductor processing power uh, like um, is called the, the speed of semiconductor processing power advancement is called Moore's Law. We have a similar thing going on actually in genome sequencing and yet uh, these tools have not yielded efficiencies in new drugs. So this is Moore's Law. Uh, the inverse is called Eroom's Law, uh, coined by Jack Scannell, who actually spoke here last year. He's an advisor to Molecule and Hellspan Capital. And this has caused a lot of consternation in the biopharma field where they're basically burning investors' money. Internal R&D pipelines are burning investors' money. But it's actually more efficient to source innovation outside of pharma. Um, going back to 1971, that seems to be the year when everything started to go wrong. There's even a whole website on it called WTF Happened in 1971, and they break down some of these statistics. So you can see total factor product productivity declined, uh, even though the developing world continued to develop, the Western developed world started to decay and decline. Um, another issue, relatedly, is around the same time we had a decline in NIH funding original ideas. So now we fund increasingly incremental work. So um, maybe we shouldn't starve scientists of funding. It's getting harder and harder to get new grant funding through the NIH. So the first premise is that science and technology develop are among the most important human endeavors. Premise two, the societal payoff from investing in science has been greater than any other area. Premise three, our most talented people are often in the lab instead of easier and more lucrative careers elsewhere. So we have brain drain away from science. So the conclusion, of course, is let's starve scientists of resources. Mm -hmm. We spend about 2.5% of US GDP on R&D, which is really not a lot. That's almost like saving and investing only 2.5% of your income. Um, so let's do an overview of the biomedical economy. We can zoom in here and see that all of the capital ultimately comes from the public. That's all of us through taxes. It goes to the NIH, about 50 billion a year now. Some of it goes into capital markets. It, some ends up in venture capital that builds these biotech startups uh, and invests in them. They do early stage clinical development and license the data and assets to big pharma. Everybody relies on these CROs, contract research organizations, to do the preclinical research in animals as well as the clinical research. The data are provided to regulators who decide to approve. And then payers like insurance or government paying bodies that decide to reimburse. And then the doctors who ultimately prescribe it. And that's about a trillion dollars a year market. Um, a trillion dollars a year market. So, um, and yet, uh, we don't have that much progress. So, you know, something happened around the 1970s, maybe Nixon played some kind of a role in that. Um, there were recent initiatives like the war on cancer, that, so Biden's cancer moonshot, the UK national war on cancer, etc. And it's not the first time. We're throwing more money, more energy at the same uh, system, and it hasn't really yielded much. So the survival increase of all cancer patients since 1975 was only about 5%. Um, and these are not good years. These are years after you've had chemotherapy and radiation. A lot of that improvement is actually earlier diagnosis. The drugs are not improving. We are also doing smoking less and slightly better lifestyle. And everybody has a two-thirds chance of getting cancer in your lifetime, so it's something we should really pay attention to. So the question is, why are we not making more rapid progress, given that most biopharma dollars go to cancer research? And maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with the dogma, the paradigm about what causes cancer or what cancer actually is. It's kind of like we have that same problem in Alzheimer's. Um, cancer isn't the leading cause of death, by the way. It's cardiovascular disease by far. And yet, big pharma barely works on cardiovascular disease because of the incentive structure. So that's another area that maybe DSI can help. Um, pharma spends a lot more money on oncology than cardiovascular. 
it's more profitable, it's faster studies, it's a lower bar for approval. Uh, but the success rate of getting a oncology drug approved is actually considerably lower than in cardiovascular disease. So we can see the success rate here is about 4% uh, from phase one to approval in cardiovascular, it's 20%. So there's something really wrong with the incentive structure that pharma is just working on the thing that they think they can make the most money on rather than the thing that's actually killing most of us. Some good news though, um, clinical trial success rates are rising pretty rapidly. This is data from Andrew Lowe's group at MIT. And he basically argues that this is because we have more external innovation, small biotech companies and academic spin-outs rather than internal biopharma R&D, as well as we're more directly targeting the root causes of disease uh, because we know the genes that are mutated rather than complex diseases where we don't really know the cause. Some other good news is that um, in the year 2000, uh, only 13% of, only 13 of drugs came from internal R&D pipelines in big pharma. You fast forward to 2018, 80% of the best-selling drugs in the world actually came from outside of pharma, which creates a really um, important uh, set of responsibilities uh, on the shoulders of people in biotech. The problem is there's a bottleneck. There are not nearly enough biotech companies getting started, and hopefully we can help with that with these side. Here's some more data showing that startups are about eight times more efficient per dollar at getting new drugs approved. Okay, so switching gears to critique academia, I know this will be fun for many of you who spent a lot of time in the bowels of academia. Um, so it's a new orthodoxy like the Catholic Church, and like the Church, it's mostly LARPing, live action role play, getting papers approved without real world impact. Um, and the problem that I see in academia is not just exploitation of the junior laborers, but um, it's dogma and an unwillingness to be disruptive or rock the boat. So uh, you can see here a tenure committee where you swear allegiance to the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's, which turned out not to be true, but everybody in academia in the neuroscience space for 20 years believed in this idea. Um, another is uh, a professor punishing two PhD students for not pulling all-nighters in the lab. So one of the objectives of DSI is to allow fast, easier access to funding for renegade academics with unpopular hypotheses. Um, and here's Richard Feynman, who would never make it in academia today because he was too much of a disagreeable curmudgeon, but a genius too. So I mentioned uh, Alzheimer's. This is an example of the amyloid hypothesis where we were led astray for a very long time. Um, I don't have time to get into too much details, but long story short, pretty much all of the attempts at curing Alzheimer's were directed at this one protein, this one gene product, uh, amyloid beta, and it turned out that was really not the way to go. Uh, and it turned out also that there was this cabal of academics uh, that, that suppressed any alternative theory. They were based in top institutions. Um, so maybe amyloid beta is uh, not the cause, it's just correlated. It's like blaming the firefighters for the fire. Um, and to wit, uh, FDA approved a amyloid beta targeting monoclonal antibody and against the wishes of their own advisory committee, which they'd never done before. Uh, and this prompted an investigation of the Department of Justice into the coziness, the ties between this biopharma company, Biogen, and FDA. Um, so this is an example of regulatory capture. So pharma is the biggest lobbying group by far. It spends $400 million a year on lobbying in DC. And three of the advisors to this advisory committee actually resigned over their approval of that drug which was ultimately not reimbursed by the insurance companies. Okay, so how can DSI help here? Um, well, we should probably have a definition. Here's a definition I use. DSI is an open source movement to source, evaluate, fund, execute, and commercialize new research without reliance on governments, large corporations, or established institutions. Um, and you know some of these organizations. I'll just speed through this because I'm almost out of time. Uh, BioXYZ, check out some of these DAOs and get involved. VitaDAO is a DAO that um, I advise, and we have deployed a fair amount of capital recently into longevity biotech projects. Um, so here's a quote from Jurgen Drews, head of R&D at Roche, saying uh, pharma um, is not attacking the root causes of disease, and that's biotech's job. I'd argue aging is at the root more than anything else. David Baltimore saying pharma was asleep at the wheel regarding the biotech revolution in the 90s. Okay, so. Um, I don't have time to get into long bio too much, but long story short, uh, even if we cured cancer, all types of cancer tomorrow, it would only extend population lifespan by about two years, 
because another age-related disease would come affect us after that. So really the only way to extend healthy lifespan on a population level is to slow aging itself and extend the period of healthy life. So we can do that because we understand the basic biology of aging, the mechanisms that cause aging. Uh, here's some more in detail. Here are some of the genes that when modified extend lifespan, some of the small molecules or drugs that do so. This list is a little out of date. Here's a couple more of my favorite interventions. Here's an example of an accelerated aging mouse that was given a longevity drug, and it's Littermate that is uh, the same exact mouse genetically, but was given one of these longevity drugs, so you can tell one is much younger than the other. Here are some of the smart cookies who've gotten into the space. This is my appeal to eat those slide. Um, Peter Thiel is uh, drinking um, young blood every morning. I have it on good authority to stay young, so that's what we all need to do. Um, here's a graphic showing that the number of longevity biotech companies is increasing exponentially. You can see more on longevitylist.com from my partner, Nathan Chang. Here's some of the investors in the space. Uh, here's some of the companies in the space. Uh, I, I suggest if you guys are um, politically minded or religiously minded, you can get involved with this new movement we're creating called Vitalism. So there's a religion-shaped hole in the human psyche, and people fill it with bad stuff like consumerism or nationalism. Uh, but we should fill it with good stuff. And what we think is good is um, valuing human life and longevity and good health. So some of my colleagues are creating this movement uh, to do this. And we're actually having a conference in uh, Rhode Island about this soon. OK, so um, I'll speed through this. These are two books you should definitely read, Network State and Sovereign Individual, as well as uh, Art of the Deal, incredible book. Um, so uh, Sovereign Individual. Uh, Sovereign Individual, uh, the forward was from Peter Thiel. It was written in the 1990s. It predicted crypto and a lot of other things. The startup societies are one way we're aiming to kind of take some of the power away from these legacy countries that are not treating their citizens very well and, and start fresh in new places. Um, Nicholas Anzinger put together this graphic. You can check him out. Um, we need to escape because governments are becoming more authoritarian. There's central bank digital currencies, human rights violations. You can try to vote. Uh, it doesn't always work out, or you can exit, vote with your feet. Uh, people are migrating to a lot of these different jurisdictions right now. Portugal and UAE are quite popular. Um, there's a strong correlation between personal freedom and economic freedom. Um, FDA, uh, so Thomas Jefferson once said, was the government to prescribe to us our medicine and diet, our bodies would be in such keeping as our souls are now. They were quite poetic back then. So we want to create our own sort of uh, safe haven for medical innovation. Uh, and we're doing the first one in Prospera in the Caribbean. We're doing a long bio and DSI conference this November. You guys should all come. Um, you should read the network state. We did this uh, gathering in Montenegro called Zuzalu. It was funded by Vitalik Buterin from Ethereum and co-organized by VitaDAO. We're doing a sort of round two called Vitalia and Prospera. So if you guys want to come by this winter, check it out. It's actually pretty easy to get to Rotom. There are a lot of direct flights. Um, and so we believe that medical tourism and regenerative medicine are booming. It's the future of medicine, but there's no one major hub. People go to all these other jurisdictions for it. So we want to build the most efficient regulatory framework and nexus for advanced therapies. So here's a, a mock-up of what the, the clinics can look like. Um, we already have some buildings in Prospera and people doing gene and cell therapy there. Um, here's some of the buildings under construction right now. So it's going to be a cool place to live. You're a digital nomad. This is the master plan, sort of futuristic city. Uh, where we actually control the civil code, so we control the business regulations and tax regulations. There's already a world-leading regenerative medicine clinic there uh, where people are getting all kinds of cell therapies led by a uh, very prominent physician, Glenn Terry, so you guys can look him up. We want to create our own mini FDA regulatory state there to expedite these clinical trials. Okay, so finally to conclude, sorry, we may not have time for much questions. Um, these are the layers of DSI. Um, hat tip to uh, Barrett and Nicholas for this sort of uh, thinking. Infrastructure layer, funding layer, execution layer. Um, so the vision I have for the future, fully automated luxury cloud labs. We get humans out of the drudgery of pipetting. Humans shouldn't be doing that to begin with. Uh, make uh, new startups and partnerships seamless to launch with clear IP ownership. Good ideas get funded quickly without bureaucracy. Academics don't play the glass bead game of Herman Hesse where they just compete on these arbitrary pointless games. Dogma is inevitable. That's just kind of how science and our brains seem to work. But maybe we can shift the paradigm faster. 
Um, we don't have as much control by cartelized industries, whether it's fossil fuels or biopharma industries, holding back innovation. We make it a lot easier to launch a startup and that we, lead, we lobby governments in order to change their regulatory structures. So DSI brings the computer revolution to the world of atoms, just like the printing press decentralized information during the Protestant Reformation. Uh, we may be able to do the same thing for science. So it's an open source alternative to the corporation state uh, where we can provide an alternative to the government-backed monopoly cartels in science and pharma. So with that, thank you guys for listening, and you can't put the cat back in the bag. So hopefully we can all together drive this movement forward. Cheers. Let's give it up for Sebastian.